have not even given yourself to the process of what it takes to actually hear from God. You are just in this place of, oh, I don't know, I'm trying to think, I don't know, and things remain stuck there. We fear so much making the wrong decision that we make none at all. But I want to help you understand this, that when your heart is right with God, when your heart is not overtaken by sin, when your heart is not overtaken by idols, God will help you make the right decision. He will not watch you actually make a mistake. I want you to make that very, very bold in your heart. Welcome once again, everyone, and I am um, glad to be here. It's always a privilege when I get to share the word with you all, and I do not take any one of those um, opportunities for granted. So this morning I have been assigned to open up the month. Um, as you guys know, the theme of our month is restoration of lost time. And so I have been given the honor of opening up the month with my teaching. And um, so I'll be spending some time today. I'm really wanting to focus on some things as far as this topic is concerned. And I want to reiterate something that Damala um, usually says, because I know many times when we talk about the restoration of lost time. Well, thank you so much, uh, Susan, for confirming that uh, YouTube is working fine. Thank you. Okay, so I know usually when we talk about restoring lost time, we're just like, you know what? God's going to restore the years. <laughs> God's going to restore everything and all of that. But we're trying to take the time to look into these things deep, right? And not just you know, skim over them and say, Father, restore, right? It's good that we pray this prayers, but one of the things we try to do in this ministry is we try to raise people who are not expecting to leave from one miracle to another, but people who can truly understand the way that God, you know, um, sees things, right? The way that God operates, the ways of God. Yeah, I think that's the way I would put it. So it's one of the things that we try to do here. So beyond coming and let's just say, oh, you know, this is how God will restore, you know, lost time. This is how God will do this. We, we love to do that. But I think one of the best things that we can do for you is to actually hand you the truth, right? And then you can sit down and, you know, put that truth to work in your life and really see your life uh, take off and, and take shape. And many times if you really have, um, these truths from the word, if you, if you are exposed to the way that God sees things, it really shields you, um, from being open to all kinds of attack from the enemy. Okay. So this week I will be, you know, like I said, delivering the first teaching on this and I'm going to just do, um, a portion of it because I know we have the other ministers who will be ministering powerfully on this. Um, and so we'll get into the teaching, but before that, let's just, um, you know, say a quick word of prayer. Father, I thank you for the privilege to stand before you today and before your people to teach this topic. Lord, I yield my vessel over to you. I hand this time, I hand this space, I hand this teaching, I hand everyone over to you, Lord. I ask that you do that which you have proposed in your heart for this time in the name of Jesus. Lord, we have gathered unto you and not unto man. And so we ask that even as we sit down at your feet today and hear your word, that you cause transformation in our lives in the name of Jesus. We ask that you change us from the inside out. We ask that there indeed be a restoration that is worked in our lives, each and every one of us. Oh, I see a very clear signal in the spirit that there will indeed be a, a, a work of restoration in the lives of people, even as we do this teaching today, okay? In the different ways that people have had things stolen from them. Lord, I thank you because you will be doing a precise work of restoration even today in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Um, and I ask that you take hold of my vessel, take charge of the words, let it come forth with power. And I ask that even this time be given over to you and every distracting spirit, every interfering spirit is hereby arrested um, and removed from this gathering today in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Whew. So I, while I was praying, I saw a very clear signal in the spirit. I'm telling you right now, I saw a very clear signal in the spirit that there's going to be restoration. What I saw is that God is giving people back. Like he's giving people back what was taken from them. I'm telling you right now, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not even making it up. And so I'm excited already before I've even started the teaching. I'm so excited. And I ask that as we go uh, into the word today, that our hearts are open and that we're able to see um, what God is saying to each and every one of us in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Okay, so let's um, just open uh, very simply. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on with uh, my computer, but uh, uh oh, okay, give me one second. Okay, good. I was getting one of those pop up messages that just new iPhone. <laughs> um, so, okay. I'm going to start from Psalms 90 and verse 12. I think it's verse 12 I'm going to read. It's a very short verse and one that many of us know, but I want to open up with that verse to kind of put it as seed in our hearts so that as I teach this, this, this particular verse, this scripture is sitting there somewhere in our hearts and we're looking at everything that um, will be coming to us today, you know, within the frame of that verse of scripture. So Victoria, if you can put Psalm 90 and verse 12 on the screen, um, that'd be good. So it says here, it says, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Very powerful verse. And I'm pretty sure many of us are familiar with it and we heard it a lot growing up. Um, but I thought that it, you know, I, I, again, I always say, I think the older you get, the more things, you know, appear to you, the more things look kind of different for you. The, what, what we're seeing here is that if for some reason you are living life in a way where you're not cognizant of the importance or the role that time plays in the actualization of your destiny or things of that sort, it is very possible that you will be living in a way that can be described as foolish. Do you understand what I'm saying? And the reason why I'm saying this is because, you know, when you're a child, you're not really thinking in this way, you know, and you just think that everything, you know, you know, goes. But you see, the, 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 the strange thing is that even in adulthood, there are people who live their life very ignorant of the importance of time in matters of their destiny, matters of, you know, just what it is God will do in their lives. So I'll read that again. It says, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. That is that it is in your understanding of how time impacts your life that you understand how to order your steps and how to carry out you know the affairs of your life in a way that is marked by wisdom so when it says teach us to number our days it says that we may apply our hearts to wisdom not necessarily that we might take time to um you know start going to get delivered from whatever spirit is distracting no it said that we may apply our hearts to wisdom okay because what i'm seeing here is that if you can like i said Get that understanding of what time does for you, what time means to you, you will order your life in a different way. You will address things the way that they should. The context of things will be clear to you. So you won't see a thing happening in your life and be like, oh, this thing has come again. Whereas this is something you are supposed to rise up and attack with all vehemence. Do you understand what I'm saying? So understanding that the number of our days are limited. And so this is not necessarily okay, this is the number. No, it's that you have an understanding that one, our days have numbers. We're not immortal. So we have an allotted time to be here. Two, the fact that the way man is built, his life is broken out in different seasons. And so there are things that may happen in one season where it, of your life where it may never be able to happen in another season. So you sit down and God allows you, gives you the wisdom to number your days properly. So you look at a certain season of your life and you understand that, you know what, in this window of my life, I should be doing A, B, C, X, Y, Z. As a result of that, what do I need to be doing right now in order for this thing to appear in the right time in my own life? This is what it's really about. So we'll talk about restoration and like I said, God will do a work of restoration because like Shade said, there are many of us that if we look back, if we point back in our lives, we can see moments, we can see windows where our steps were not really ordered by wisdom. We did things however we thought we wanted to. We did things, you know, in a way that we thought, you know, it doesn't matter. Nobody cares, you know, all of that. But 
you get older, but not just older, because there are some times that, you know, there are people who, they get older, but they're not really getting wiser, right? It's because, like I said, you have to get to where you're able to number your days. Because when you don't, you will simply be getting older. The calendar keeps flipping over for you, but you're not any wiser. So you'll see that there are people who, they're in certain ages, they're in certain seasons of their life, and they are going for things. They are trying to accomplish things that they should have achieved maybe two seasons ago. And it's not even just that they are trying to do it at that time. There's even still no sense of, listen, I'm putting my all into it. They're just like, eh, let me just do, you know, it's just very like a desicle about it. I hope that as we go through this teaching, this scripture will sit in your heart so that as we talk about the other things that are, uh, are around and surround this concept of time and, you know, losing time and time being restored, that you have your heart pondering on what dimensions of wisdom, what nuggets of wisdom, what, what, what layers of wisdom you need to have to be able to put your life back in perspective. Okay, so when you think about a man's life and basically how man is built, I already said it right now that man has a limited amount of time, especially like when you think about here. Okay, we are in this sphere of reality. We're on the other side of eternity, like we others say, what well, like we always say, and on this side of eternity, things are measured by time. We look at things from the standpoint of time because we operate within time. And so many times, you know, we might look at it as a disadvantage and think, ah, you know, it's because of time. You know, I know there have been times when people will be like, oh, this 24 hours in the day, they're not enough or whatever. Guess what? That's all you're getting, right? That's all you're getting. It's already set. It's already fixed, right? And so sometimes we might be looking at time and thinking, ah, this thing is a disadvantage to me or like, oh, I wish this and I wish that. And you're wanting to operate in the way that like, you know, God operates where like where he is, there isn't time involved, but it's even for our own benefits. Okay, it's even for our own good that we have time because it means that because we are in time, so much can happen. One of the things that you will learn and you will hear about the spirit realm over and over is that time doesn't exist. So as opposed to the way we live here, where if something happens, there is still, you know, a chance of fixing it, a chance of recovering it. That doesn't happen in the spirit realm. I hope you are with me. Time is not a thing there. Like there isn't such a thing as time. So if someone does something today, like if somebody upsets me today, if somebody does something to you today, they have the chance of time to come back to you tomorrow to fix it. They have the opportunity to come back to you tomorrow to apologize, to repair that relationship and things move on, right? You know, if you lose time in the sense that, oh, you were supposed to do a certain thing and maybe you missed that window, you do have time, right? So the idea is that it's actually to our advantage that we have time here. In the spirit realm, when you, if you do, if, you know, if the spirit does something in the spirit realm, you know, the things that occur, there, they're not viewed in, it, with it, would I say within the framework of time once it has happened that like that's it once it is said like it's 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 just it's infinite so they're not thinking about things in terms of oh today or tomorrow so we are the ones who are trying to take things from the spirit realm and trying to open it up if you will we're trying to see where it can fit because your entire life your entire story your entire destiny it's already spoken by God and it's ex like it's from one end to another like there, it, there isn't a time like so it's it's us who look at things and we're like okay at a certain age this should happen the way that god sees it once he has released it it's not he's not measuring it by time in that way right it exists infinitely and that's it but so it's then our duty right like when we're here in this world to take a look at things that god is telling us take a look at things that god is uh maybe revealing to us and understand okay this is where it fits this is where it fits because as far as we live in this realm we we have to fix things in time we have to fit things in time it's just the way we do things here in order to keep our lives organized and in order to stay in the system that obtains here okay so what that means is that for a man time is like the most expensive commodity that he has it's sad that we Many of us, you know, like maybe come from different kinds of cultures or environments or even the world today, to be honest, that places value on many other things and not really time. 
So you'll see that there are people whose main focus in life is money. Oh, let's make this money. Let's make this money. And the truth is, while money might seem like, oh, this thing fixes everything, money will never compare to the uh, asset that time is for you. So a man's life is truly measured um, by time. It's measured in terms of time, not in terms of money. You understand that? It's not measured in terms of, of activities. It's not, measured, it's not measured in terms of money. It is measured in terms of time. So that's why you see when a person passes on, we mark it and say, okay, this person was here from so-and-so time to so-and-so time. The idea is that we're not just listing that out, but that we can also trace certain things. Oh, while they were here, they did this. While they were here, they did that. A man's life, a man's destiny is truly measured in terms of time. So let's say a person is given this entire window of time, maybe 90 years. And then they spend the first 60 years of their life just doing whatever they please. Those 60 years are years that that person can't get back. That's the harsh reality. There are years that the person can't get back. So imagine that at 60, you are now just realizing that God intended for you to play football. What are you going to do with that? Hardly much. Hardly much. You can hardly do much with that. So... Why have I spent time just explaining just, you know, the emphasis on time and why it's this important and what it represents and all of that for us? It's because when Satan wants to really do a number on your, on your life or in your life, you know, however you want to look at it, when Satan wants to really do a number on you and in your life, he doesn't just go and attack things that you have. He doesn't necessarily just go and attack, I don't know, the people around you. What he tries to really steal from you is time is time it's time so if you find yourself in a situation where it seems like you know the enemy is taking large chunks large bites of time out of your life you should be very 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 concerned too many of us are too relaxed with things just passing we're like oh you know next year we go again you know next year we try again I mean, listen, it's good to have, you know, an attitude where you're like, okay, next year. But it should not be from a place of complacency. You should be very determined to be on track with the schedule of what God wants to do with your life. So it's not so much because God assumes that, oh, at a certain age you'll be this, at a certain age you'll be that. It's because you know as a human being that if God is telling me that I'm going to be this or I'm going to achieve that, because of my understanding of time in this realm that we're in, it means that in this window, this one should have been done. In this window, this other layer must have come in. In that window, you know, X, Y, Z, and on and on and on. You are the one who has the responsibility to take that thing and put it in the framework of time. That's what it is. So, like I said, when Satan really decides to attack your life, when Satan decides to really, you know, come for you or really put you at a disadvantage, the biggest thing he would look to steal from you, that he would look to take from you, is time. It's time. It's time. So when you see us leading prayers here and when you see us being emphatic and saying, you know, like we're, you know, addressing delay, we're addressing, you know, things of that nature, it's because, listen, it is the most critical thing for you. It's the most important thing for you. You talk to people who may be wasted. Because if you ask them, that's the way they'll define it. Because, you know, that was a time in their life when they could have been doing something. And they weren't doing that. And they've now come to this, this, this understanding, this place of awareness. The regret you hear from their voice is a stronger message than somebody telling you, hey, you know, don't do this or don't do that. Many times that, that regret you hear in their voice is a stronger message. So today we're going to be looking at the different ways that, you know, the enemy looks to uh, access people's life and steal time from them. There are many different ways. I think I've, I've highlighted just one, two, three, four. Four different ways that the enemy tries to steal time from people. And for many people, this is actually how the enemy succeeded in stealing from you. The, the Bible says that the thief cometh not but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. This is the biggest target. So yes, it's possible that maybe Satan, you know, would want to attack your car or, you know, attack your this or that and steal a car from you. But I promise you, that's not the end goal. Why? Because if he can steal time from you, he would have been 
able to rob you of, would I say, um, portraying, carrying out that thing that God intended for you to do. And you have to understand that this whole thing, we always say it is that once you decide that you're a Christian, it's like you signed up for battle. <laughs> you signed up for war. At any point in time, Satan is looking for ways to, you know, to mess with things that God is doing. He's always looking for ways to, you know, insert himself, get in there. So while stealing time from you might seem like it's a personal attack on you, maybe he doesn't like you or whatever, understand the big picture. is that It's not really about you. I think that many times if you take yourself out of that picture and look at it very objectively, then you will know why you need to be on guard and why you need to be at alert. Because why should I be minding my business? And because one person has a bone to pick with, you know, someone else, then they now you know, decide to, that one decides to take it out on you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Satan is constantly looking for a way to, to, to mess with the work that God is doing. He's constantly looking for ways to, to, to scuttle just things that God is trying to do. And because of that, he then looks for people because that's the biggest project that God has in place is man. The biggest project that God has in place is man. So that's why he looks for different men different people who he can mess with their time. So a lot of us were very ignorant, you know, or at least the generations before us as far as spiritual things. We didn't have a lot of wisdom. We didn't have a lot of insight to drive the affairs of our lives. So people would from time to time find other sources, find other means to, to make their lives work, to figure things out. But what they didn't understand was that many times they were exchanging something with Satan. Many times they were creating an opening for the enemy to peep into their life. This is really how it works many times. Is that Satan may not understand what it is that God is looking to do in your life in this framework of time. But he will come around your life and start sniffing things. He's sniffing the activities, maybe heightened activity of angels. He's sniffing things that you are doing. He's, he's looking to get information out of you. He's even operating through these kinds of people that I like to refer to as listening stations. People that he has lodged demons in and they come around you and they try to get information from you and they report back to their master, right? So he puts these kinds of things in place. Why? Because he wants to get a picture. He wants to understand what does this man represent in what God is doing. So it's the exact same thing he tried to come do with um, even the garden. Did God say? Did God not say? He doesn't know the whole thing. He wants to get that information from you. So many times, Satan will access that information because we are not at alert. We don't understand. There are people that will tell you how maybe someone came to them in a dream and when they were saying this and they were doing this with that person or, or the, you know, the person collected this and collected that from them and after that, maybe things just looked different in their lives. There are people who come from families where maybe um, their parents or grandparents went to visit this, you know, I don't know, like which doctors and those kinds of people like, oh, help me look into this child's destiny so that I can know. What they didn't realize was that this is not, <laughs> this is not, like a, a friend or some type of person who is like, you know what, I'm observing privacy laws. I'm just going to grab the information and give it to you. No, the moment you do that, you open your life up for Satan to scan through to see exactly why he needs to steal from you and where he needs to go and wait for you. So many people came into this situation. Please try to stay with me, right? I, this thing, my notes are already kind of being pushed to the side, but I do want to mention this. This aspect is very, very important. Many of us here are Africans, and so you'll understand what I'm saying. Some of us come from these places and these kind of things where it is very common for people to go visit these kinds of people like, oh, please help me look in this child's life. Oh, please help me see what you know, this child's destiny is. Or just, we go there maybe for other kinds of things. But the thing is, Satan is not a gentle man, okay? So maybe you went there because you wanted him to give you insight or maybe you wanted information of, oh, this person will be rich, this person, that. and you would think, okay, he would just, you know, access the case file or, you know, get this information or whatever, you know, and then hand it to you. That's not how it works. What you do is you have basically opened you're, the simple act of you going there and saying, I want you to, that's giving Satan permission to step into that thing. And now he can access that. And then many times these people will find that later in life, maybe many years in life, something happens to them. Something just gets triggered in their life and things just start going haywire. 
Now, we're going to be looking at the different ways, like I said, that, said, that Satan steals time from people because I don't want us to always look at things and be like, ah, this is Satan. Oh, it's a demonic, this thing. Because don't get me wrong, it's one of the factors, okay? It is a very strong factor. But I want us to look at many other reasons why, you know, this loss of time happens in people's lives. So I'm speaking from the first uh, point, which I titled demonic delays. And I think that's why I'm already in there. I'm already in the, you know, that path already. Demonic delays, demonic delays. There are times when Satan goes to lodge these things in people's life. And like I said, there are many different ways that this happens. One way is that people give him access to their file. A file that God has kept. We get too impatient. We get too curious. We're like, we must know this thing. Okay. And then we go to meet someone and literally give them access to our file. So now Satan gets to scan through the whole thing and say, eh, this one is supposed to become this. This one is supposed to become that. Wonderful. So I will just keep watching. I will keep following. So I know the perfect time for me to throw this thing in their path that then kicks them off that path. Why? Because why should they get there? So this is one of the ways that, you know, the enemy does that is we open that door by trying to find, you know, help or get his involvement in one thing or another. And it is a way that Satan gets in there to mess with timing. So you'll now see that that person gets to a time in their life and perhaps they're stuck. Every one of their classmates, everyone graduated and everyone is now working. But guess what? That one person is not working. They can't get a job no matter what they do. I don't know why I'm having to emphasize this, but when we pray about the restoration of time, understand that these are things that, um, these are things that God will address. Understand that these are things that God will address. Too many of us, because of this thing, the reason why there's so much attack on our lives, there's this delay, there's this stagnation, all of that, is because someone opened the door for Satan to step in there and have a say in their timing, in their life, in their destiny. So someone should be, you know, doing X, Y, Z at a certain time, but you know, a door was already open to Satan and he had the opportunity to mess with that schedule. A person should be in a certain place at this age, but it, it didn't happen. Why? Because Satan was already allowed in there. And so one of the ways that he does this is that he will, there are times when the reason why a person has lost time or the reason why a person is currently losing time is because one way or another, the enemy was able to come into their situation and pressure them, put a lot of, 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 of weight on them, put a lot of pressure on them to cause them to step outside of God's will, to step outside of what God was trying to do. So there's the one aspect where it's like, okay, this is just like, it's literally a uh, unlimited access visa that people give to Satan, allowing him peep into their files because they think that's the way they're going to get information, information that they should be getting from God. The other way is that they are in this position, they are in this place where a lot of pressure is now placed on them. Maybe because they are expecting something, maybe because they are wanting something and it seems to not be happening as quickly as possible. So now there's this pressure from the enemy. And at that time that they are waiting for this thing to happen, it's not necessarily that they're out of their season. Do you understand? That's why the Bible says that teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days. Because the reason why people feel the need to respond to that pressure is because somehow they have believed that they're actually out of God's timing. They have believed that they are actually behind. So that you can see everyone, you know, doing this. Maybe everyone is, you know, getting married. Maybe everyone is building. Everyone is traveling because you have agreed or somehow come to this place in your mind that you are behind schedule. Then you respond to that pressure from Satan. And that thing can be loud because it will make it such that not, it's not just that everybody else in the world is doing that thing. Everybody in your own circle. And we might look at it and be like, ah, you know, people should be able to stand firm. People should be able to stand strong. But, well, maybe you should speak when you are the only one in a circle of maybe 10 people who 
everyone else has moved on you know they seem to be doing great they seem to be doing one other thing or what other stuff in their life but you are the only one who um it seems that that's not working for you and so because of that there's that temptation to to step out of god's will to respond to that pressure a simple example is situations where it's like, oh, maybe, you know, you had sat down with God, decided that you were going to be, uh, you know, a wonderful Christian, a church girl, and all of this, all of that. Oh, you know, your body is the Lord's temple, all of that stuff, right? And then suddenly you get to a certain point in time and it feels like everybody else is getting married. And maybe you're not. And it's not even just everybody. All of the bad girls <laughs> in the city, they are getting married and you're not, right? So obviously in your head it's like wait what is going on am i under attack meanwhile it's not that you're under attack your timing is just different from everybody but satan uses the ah we'll put pressure on her then it starts to pressure you starts to pressure and some of that pressure might even come from voices in your life voices of friends voices of aunties and uncles all these kinds of people so i'm using you know marriage as an example but other times it's job other times it's you know different kinds of things Maybe, oh, you, you know, why are you still here in this country? Everybody has left. You are the only one. You are the only one. And you're not thinking, looking at yourself that it's true. Why am I the only one here? Everybody has, has left the country. Everybody has jacked, but I'm still the only one. So that pressure is on you. Ah, before you can even sleep, somebody is texting you from Canada number. Hey, hon. Hey, friend, you didn't even know that they were processing this thing. You know, they're texting you from their calendar and you're like, who is this? Who is your hon? And next thing, ah, it's me now, your bestie. And you're like, what? My best friend left this place and left me, you know? So literally two ways, this kind of different situations that Satan just puts that pressure on you. He mounts it on you. Everybody else is doing it. Everybody is going there. Everybody has this. Everybody has that. And I don't. And then you decide to step out of God's allocation, step out of God's will and decide to do something that is outside of what God has for you. You decide to do something that is in fact many times against God. This is enough for Satan. Once he's able to pressure you and push you to that point, then he knows he has an in. And at that time, he can begin to take large chunks, large bites of time out of your life. So this is one of the ways that it happens. These demonic delays, demonic delays. Sometimes he will cause the situation, cause you to get out of line. Then he can introduce the delay. Some other times, like I said, it, it may be a background issue, maybe a family issue, right? And it's just a demonic embargo. This is why I'm saying that at no point in time should you sit down and be okay with stuff. I always tell people you should always be able to go back to God and check and see, okay, what is going on with this timing? Don't assume that everything that is going on in your life is, oh, I'm in a waiting season. Don't assume. And don't assume that everything going on in your life is a, is a delay from Satan. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have to understand what is going on in your life so that you know how to respond. You shouldn't sit down in a place where Satan is putting the weight of delay on your life and you are saying, oh, I'm in a process. Meanwhile, there's no case file open for you for any process in heaven. There's no process. This is just Satan sitting on your case file. This is just Satan taking chunks, bites out of your life in terms of time. And you're like, oh, you know, I just feel like I'm in this process. Or, oh, God is... And God is like, it's not me. It's not me. You're under attack, dear. This is what it is. I want you to be very, very discerning. And that brings me to my next point. The reason or the way that um, Satan is able to steal time from people is a lack of discernment. A lack of discernment. So there are times when people cannot discern the cause of why they are where they are. If you can sit down and discern that the reason why you are not yet outside the country is because God still will have you where you are. There's no pressure on you to move outside of that. But when you cannot discern, chances are you will take a step and you will take it in the flesh. When people cannot discern what's really happening in their lives, what season they are in, who is responsible for it and all of that, it is highly likely that you will take an action outside of what God is doing for you. This discernment is key. There are many voices that will be around us. None of them is without significance. So you must be able to discern, you must be able to tell at every point in time, this voice that is speaking to me, is it a voice of counsel? Or is it a voice that, this, you know, the enemy is empowering? Jesus had to know this very well. 
Because even his own trusted ally, even his own team member came to him and he had to discern and tell Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. This is one serious way that people are, you know, able, to, people lose time or that the Satan is able to steal time from people. Let me put it that way. Is that they cannot discern. So imagine, um, Peter coming to Jesus and saying, don't say that thing again. Die what? You're not dying. You know, what kind of thing is this? And Jesus now reasoned and said, it's true. It's true. Uh, Peter is speaking, you know, Rema. This is Rema. You know what? I will not. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is what many of our lives look like. You, you, you know what's interesting? I, I know there's a second reference I'm making to Prophet suddenly, and I apologize for it, but I really think that some things were highlighted there. A lack of discernment will quickly put you in a place where you are at, at loss. Because you sit down. A madman said something. Somebody texted you something. There's no discernment within you to tell, ah, is this thing from God or is it not from God? You say, ah, it must be God. I knew it. I said it. God said that my season is now. My time is now. And then you just run with it. And before you know it, you find that you are running alone. Every kind of thing is stolen from you. So what you thought you were avoiding by jumping on something that Satan puts in your way as an opportunity to grab, you end up having to pay for it in the back end and even more. One of the things that I learned this year, I mean, I've always known it, but like I, I like it was as though God was like, let him put me in a practical class. I can remember that like when I tell you I was shook, I was shook. Hey, this discernment is so key. Listen, it's not every time that you see, oh, because, oh, and I was just sitting there out of the blue. This person texted me. I wasn't even thinking about it. It must be God. Please, please, please never get into that situation where you're like, you know what? It must be God. Always go and check God. Is it you? Don't assume. Don't assume because if you are too thirsty, if you are too like eager for things, you will jump on a bait from Satan and not know that it's from him. So early this year, I was sitting on my own, eh? I said I wanted to seek God. And you know, for some strange reason, it was like God shortly before this thing played out had put me in like a different prayer schedule, which I didn't I didn't know. And it was not convenient. It was not convenient at all. And I really wanted to kind of like push back on it and be like, ah, this is too much. God, I'm on vacation. What kind of thing is this? But I don't know why. Even my husband was like, well, I said, even me and myself, I can't tell you. I just know that this is, you know, God is calling me into this like type of prayer. And I sat down there for a number of days and I was doing it. Now, let me tell you why I'm giving this example. Because shortly before that time, someone had come to me and um, just, I was sitting down by my own, eh? I wasn't looking for anybody's trouble. Somebody came to me and was like, hey, you know, um, I know you're good at this and I know you're good at that. And I think that um, I would want you to do X, Y, Z for me. I'm trying to leave some details out. So I was like, you know what? Sure, that sounds good. This was one person. You see, this is, please take note, pay attention, because this is how Satan gets very crafty. So that's one person who had said that thing to me. So I'm thinking, wow, what a wonderful random thing. And then I think shortly after that, another thing came my way. And I said, hey, I put the two together to me. The math made sense. So I said, ha ha, this is it. God is telling me that, you know, this is what I need to do. This is what I need to do. Meanwhile, shortly before that, God had even put me on high alerts to be, to be, to watch out because there was something that he was working on. So I'm telling you that for me, I said, this is what, <laughs> this is what God is working on. It made sense. And I think the reason why it made sense to me was because this thing was going to translate to real numbers, to money. And let me just be upfront. It was going to translate to that. I said, I said you know what? It's fine. And if you have to know me. One thing about me is once I have, like once I've made my mind up, once I've decided, okay, this is what we're going to do, or this is what I'm going to do, that's it. Like you, you, you don't have to tell me twice. So I sat down there, I said, hey, I sat down on my own. This person out of nowhere came and told me this. Oh, this person out of nowhere came and told me that. I said, this must be God speaking that, oh, this and that. And when I started doing research online, I just found that, you know what? The math is mathing. Let's go. <laughs> So I told Amal, I said, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to do. He said, you know what, that sounds good. I called somebody else that was close to me, not, a, you know, a spiritually person, a spiritual person. The person was like, you know what, you should have done this since. This sounds great, all of that. This is a good, I said, wonderful and perfect. I grabbed onto it. And I'm telling you, that I, like, 
I said, I don't waste time. I sat down there, I literally started to build this website. I had a skeleton of the website together, like I'd begun to put the components in there. And remember, like I said, that in this window, I was in a it, I was in an unusual prayer pattern because God had asked me to do it. And I just kept praying and I just kept praying. Meanwhile, this time I was just, God, is this you? God, is this not, you know? Let me say this right now. There are some answers you will not get if you are not willing to press well into God. On the surface, I thought I should just be able to know. I thought I should just be able to tell. But it was almost as though God knew that this thing was coming for me and put me in that prayer schedule. Why? Because it was going to push up the, would I say, saturation level in my spirit. So I kept doing the prayers. I kept doing the prayers. Not convenient. I kept doing them. And out of nowhere, I just have this very clear dream. And it is very clear to me, <laughs> I don't want to get into details, that God was telling me that, my dear, I am not in this thing at all. This thing may look good, but I am not in it at all. Meanwhile, even before this whole window started, I had had this dream where a person was coming to talk to me and I didn't note it. But thank God that I write my dreams in paper. But the summary of what the person was telling me was to be mindful of pottage pottage so I thought they were talking about food to be mindful of pottage so it wasn't until this whole thing played out that it occurred to me that oh my goodness that dream that I had before this test would I say or this you know uh attempt from Satan to derail me that dream that I had had before then was essentially God warning me that there will be an incident where Satan is trying to cause me to exchange what he has for me for pottage literally so I remember that we just said you know it was basically said to be mindful of pottage but I didn't like I wasn't thinking too much about it I just wrote it scribbled it down and I left it and then when the whole thing played I remember that dream very very vividly that the message was clear be mindful of pottage because you know many times God will use symbols so I, like I said I wasn't really sure at that time but then it became clear and once I got that clarity from God that God is not in this thing I quickly packed it up in a, in, in a split second and it was as though once I did that the thing that God needed to show me the thing that God needed to give me became very very clear why have I taken time to give that example because it is important for you to build discernment a person who lacks discernment in this life will lose a lot of things to Satan because he will consistently come and offer you pottage in place of your destiny he will offer you something that looks good and on paper, it's good. It is noble. It is good. It is not illegal. Nothing is wrong with it. But guess what? It is not God. It is not God. So that thing will come your way. God is telling you, oh, I'm taking you somewhere. Oh, I'm preparing so something for you. I'm going to give you a hair who is going to carry my blessings. God is telling you, I'm going to give you a son who is going to be your heir. And I'm going to, you know, uh, it is through him, you know, that I'm going to cause that blessing to, you know, uh, flow to all the generations that come from you. And the next thing, Satan is able to convince you that that's, that hair does not have to come out of your own wife. That hair can come out of Hagar. Are you with me? This is what discernment will cost you. If you cannot sit down and assess decisions and analyze things and realize that ah, this thing is not... It, you know, this thing is not God. Like, it's good. Like, it makes sense. Like, it's actually logical, but it's not God. It will cost you time. So Abraham did not discern this thing. Took himself, took the advice that his wife gave him, and went to, to get a son out of, his, out of uh, his maid. And if you read the Bible, the, after that thing happened, there was a number of years, I forget now exactly, a number of years that it felt like God was not saying anything to him again. So you look at certain things and you're like, oh, you know, let me tell you this. I really think that Abraham, a lot happened to Abraham and it was likely because God needed us to learn a lot of things through his life. If we did not have the opportunity to see things play out in his life, we may not have, you know, understood how to make our own move. So there was a window of silence until God came back to him and said, walk thou before me and be perfect. That is this one that you are doing. I wasn't in it. So if you're really serious and you're really up for what I'm giving you, you better walk before me. I want to move quickly away from this so that we don't waste too much time here because um, I think I have about 30 minutes or so left. But this lack of discernment is one of the biggest thieves of people's time. Over and over, 
Satan will see that God has something for you and he will want to come and offer you his own alternative before then. Don't ever get too comfortable. Don't ever get to where you feel like, you know what, I got this. You know, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm the radar. I, <laughs> I can figure these things out. There are some things that you will have to have a, you know, a level of just sensitivity in the spirit to be able to pick it out. Because the Bible lets us know that even Satan masquerades as, a, as, as um, an angel of light. So how can you then tell the difference? You won't be able to tell by analyzing details. You wouldn't be able to tell on the ground. You will need God to help you. You will need the discernment of the Holy Spirit to know this thing looks good. This thing sounds right. This thing will do good things for people, but it is not of God. I really hope that that message has landed. The next thing that I want to say, and it's probably the last thing that I will have the chance to speak on um, in depth before we take the prayers today. I love this one, okay? So pardon me if you find me taking more time here than um, expected. But one of the other big thieves of people's time is indecision. Indecision, indecision. This one is so sneaky that people many times are not aware of it. So it's easy for you to think that the thing that's stealing your time is, you know, a foundational issue. It's a curse. It's, you know, something, an attack from Satan that is stealing time from you. But I want to tell you something right now that will honestly help your life. Indecision many times is the reason why people lose time. I'm saying it again that it's not every time, it's not every case of lost time that is Satan, you know, fighting you many times. It is this problem, it is this trap, it is this maze, it is this fog of indecision that people choose to stay in that steals time from them. So I'm going to read scriptures. I, I feel like I've been speaking for a while and I haven't even read scriptures, but let's take a look at scriptures. James 1 and 5, uh, but I think I'll read it to 8. The Bible says here, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. It said, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Verse 7 again, For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. There are many times that the reason that we don't move forward, we don't advance, we don't take actions, we don't take steps in life that God will have us take or God is, you know, kind of beckoning on us to take is because of this plague of indecision. And the Bible is very clear that don't expect that you will receive anything from God once you find yourself in this place. Let me read it again so that you know that I'm not making it up. It says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind um, and tossed. It says, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Why? Because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. There are some of us that God has told to do something. All you are with, the only thing that is left for God to do is to actually come down in person, in physical form, to tell you, sis, go. Indecision. It is a massive thief of people's time. When you find yourself halting between two things, when you find yourself unable to make a move, just understand that this is where you are. So that's why you see things in the Bible like choose ye this day, death or life. One thing with God is that he's not going to hide the other option. He's not like Satan that tries to mask things and make them look like something that they're not. He puts it very clearly. He says, this is what comes from death. This is what comes from life. Choose this day, death or life. You don't get to stay in the middle. You don't get to choose life with a side of death. You don't get to choose life with a sprinkle of death. No, you will choose one or the other. Life or death. Many times the reason that we are in this space, we are in this state where time has gone and passed us by, opportunities have gone and passed us by, is that we are unable to make a decision. Some of us fear making a mistake so much that we have involuntarily and unknowingly chosen stagnation by default. Please hear this thing loud today before I leave, you know. Don't 
forget this, if you forget any other thing, because I want it to be very loud in people's heads when they find themselves in that place where they're like, oh no, is it, is it not? So many of us fear mistakes so much more than we fear God. We fear making a mistake so much that we unconsciously have chosen stagnation. So this stagnation that we're feeling, this delay that we feel that we're experiencing, it's not even necessarily because Satan has attacked us. It's not necessarily because Satan has come to fight us. It's because we are so afraid of making a mistake that we have chosen by default stagnation. So things are supposed to happen in your life. God is opening seasons for you. God is opening things to you, but you are so afraid of that mistake that you are not going to make a decision. Oh, I'm waiting for God to speak. Oh, I'm waiting for God to give me clarity. Oh, I'm waiting for God to show me. Oh, I'm waiting for God to say it. Meanwhile, God has all but screamed it from heaven to you. Go. You have not even given yourself to the process of what it takes to actually hear from God. You are just in this place of, oh, I don't know, I'm trying to think, I don't know, and things remain stuck there. Things remain stuck there. We fear so much making the wrong decision that we make none at all. We fear it so much. But I want to help you understand this, that when your heart is right with God, when your heart is not overtaken by sin, when your heart is not overtaken by idols, God will help you make the right decision. He will not watch you actually make a mistake. I want you to make that very, very bold in your heart. One of the things that, that um, we, we get into as Christians is that we almost feel as though God is this person that is constantly looking to trap us. Aha, I caught you. I knew it that you are not sincere. We really think that everything around us, ah, God is trying to test me. And you see, this paranoia is not helping many of us. You are losing valuable time, unable to make decisions because you are so afraid. Oh, what if it's not the will of God? What if it's not? Okay, you know what? What if it's not the will of God? Guess what? God will tell you. If it's not the will of God, God will tell you. You need to settle that in your mind that he's your father and he's not waiting to trap you in a mistake. That is Satan's angle, not God's. That is Satan's angle, not God's. So as long as you have given yourself to God and you have chosen to toe the path of righteousness and walk with God in sincerity and in truth, know this, that if God has to create, you know, a lot of noise around you, if he has to do it through a donkey, he will make sure that you don't make that mistake. He will. I want you to settle this thing because you have to be able to operate and make these decisions from a place of peace and not fear. Many of us make decisions, we try to assess opportunities and decisions from a place of fear and it's the reason why we cannot hear God. It's the reason why we cannot hear God. So time is going, time is going, but you're like, oh, I'm still waiting on God. Oh, God has not yet spoken. Meanwhile, God has spoken, but you are full of fear. You are full of fear and you cannot make a move. You are stuck. You are frozen in that place. Let me tell you what it looks like when you're in that place of indecision. It's like being in the water. You see, I like the, the way the Bible uses analogies. There were many different analogies that could have been used, but I don't know why James chose to use this analogy of the sea. I'll read it once again and I'll explain what it looks like when you can't make a decision. It says here, it says, but let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. Let me explain what that thing means to you. It's that when you are in that place of indecision, even that point in time, you will not hear from God. It's not in the place of indecision that you hear God. It is in the place of faith. It is in the place of trust that you hear God, not in the place of indecision. You know why this thing, this analogy of the sea is very important? Because when you are in a place of indecision, you are like a man who is underwater. So somebody can be in the water trying to, because what you are trying to do is you are staying in that fog, in, that, in the water of indecision. And God is trying to talk to you in there, but all you are hearing is muffled sounds. Muffled sounds. You cannot hear God when you are in there. You will need to come up out of that indecision and decide what your position is. That is when you hear God. I know it doesn't sound like what you, you know, may have been hearing. I'm telling you this right now. That there are many things in your life that you will not hear God on until you've made a decision. Sometimes that decision is as simple as, 
I am fine with what God's will is in this matter. And then God says, this is what you want to do. That's op that opportunity is for you or that opportunity is not from you, but, or for you. But when you are in that place where you have not made a decision, you'll be very surprised that you will not hear God. Do you understand that if you trust your life into God's hand, God, I'm telling that God is willing to make a noise to ensure that you don't miss it. He is. You have to be able to live that way. You have to be able to believe that way. Let me share something with you um, so you understand what I'm saying. The decision is powerful. Exodus 3 from verse 1 um, to 4, I'm going to read something. It says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, listen to me now, verse 3. It says, and Moses said, that is, Moses made a decision. Do you understand what I'm saying? Moses said, he decided, he said, he said, you know what? I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. He made a decision in that moment and said, you know what? I'm going to turn aside to it. Do you know what it meant to, to see that kind of sight? You have a couple of options. Hey God, you know, you know, fear like, oh, whatever. I can tell you that even if Moses decided that, you know what, I am going to run away from here because this does not sound or this does not look right. Even in that place of a decision of I am running away, I'm telling you that he would have still heard God say, go back there. I'm speaking to you. Moses, the Bible is telling us here in verse 3, he said, he said in his heart, I will now turn aside and go and look at this thing. Verse 4, if you can read it where you are, I want you to read it. It says, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see. Once the Lord saw that Moses had made up his mind to pay attention to this thing. Once he saw that Moses had made a decision to walk towards this thing, to go and see what that thing is. It says, then the Lord spoke and called out to him, unto him out of the midst of the bush. Listen to this right now. I will say it again. Many times the reason why you still cannot hear God's voice is that you haven't made a decision. You haven't made a decision and say, you know what? This thing, I'm willing to go, you know, whichever direction God wants this thing to go. You are still thinking, hey God, what if this money goes away? What if this was the, you know, you haven't decided. Once you come into that place of making the decision, I'm telling you that your clearing, your, your hearing becomes even clearer. When you are in that place of indecision, the way James describes it, you are like a man that is under the water. Anybody shouting sounds to you like a muffled sound. You cannot make out exactly what that sound is. It is when you come up out of that place and you have decided, this is where I'm going to go. I'm following God's way on this matter. It is at that point in time that you can hear God. This is part of what Shade was saying before. Many times our hearts are still captured by idols. We're still thinking, ah, you know, we haven't come to a place of decision. I say, you know what, what God is doing is enough for me. We haven't come to a place of decision and to say, you know what, whatever thing it is, I'm fine with it. This thing shows up, you know, in many different ways in our lives. And this is why the enemy will have you there. He will convince you that you are doing sound analysis. You are not doing sound analysis. Many of you have heard the term, the, uh, the term people use, paralysis by analysis. It's a term that means that a person becomes paralyzed in a particular issue simply because of the multitude of analysis. That is that they can't decide, oh, what if this? Oh, what if that? Oh, what if this? Let me tell you. The enemy enjoys seeing you here because it doesn't even have to try. You by yourself have decided to allow your time be wasted. Many times you have to make a decision and be like, you know what? This is where we're going. God, this is, you know, you know where I am. Because when I'm saying make a decision, understand that I'm not saying that your heart is close to God. Oh, I've decided my way and God does not have a say in my life. Absolutely not. I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you that your heart has to be won. When your heart is still double-minded, when you are still in multiple places, oh, you can't tell, maybe it is, you will, Satan will continue to convince you. One day you'll be like, oh, maybe this meant that. Oh, maybe that meant that. You have to get to where your mind is one. I was thinking about some, something funny um, when I was putting these notes together and I was like, you know what? It's not every time that things are a demonic attack. Because you, I mean, we all have seen and come across those kind of situations. A situation where maybe a guy, you know, has come to a lady and telling her, oh, you know, I want to marry you. Um, 
-hmm. you know, I like you, I want to see your people. And then she says, oh, you know what? Okay, let me go and think about it. <laughs> and that thinking about it turns to God knows how many weeks, months, years. Okay, you know, it, you know it happens, right? I'm not making it up. There are people who decide to put a guy on, I'm still seeking God's face for a year. I'm still seeking God's face. 18 months have gone. I'm still seeking God's face. Six months. My dear, when you wanted to decide on whether to take that job that was going to pay you this money or that money, you could hear God. Oh. But a young man has come to you now and said, okay, you know, I want to marry or whatever. And now you are stuck. You can't decide. You are there. Everything. You, you are just confused. You are a ball of confusion. Do you understand that many times you are the one Okay, so you will say that, oh, maybe Satan is forming a weapon against you or whatever. Do you know that there are times when we as humans were the ones that are handing Satan part of the components, part of the pieces that he needs to put that weapon together? So we're saying, oh, no weapon of the enemy fashioned against me shall prosper. But while Satan is building that weapon, you, you are practically handing him all of the things that he needs to make it solid with little things like this. Someone comes to you. It's a simple thing. You go to seek God. Now, it's one thing. If God hasn't spoken, that's a different thing. But the truth is, many times, it's not that God hasn't spoken. You haven't decided. Because you are thinking, you know what? This is a good man. But I'm not sure because ha, I don't like how his shoes look and the car he's driving. It's very possible that if I wait six months, maybe ah, somebody will come and toast me and their car is better than this. Or this person has his own house because this guy doesn't have a house yet. But he has a very good heart, you know. He has a very good heart. So, but I just feel like I want to live in like a three-bedroom like that that's the first house i should live in so if i tell this guy yes what if somebody now comes to me tomorrow and you know this person has the car and the house that i need but this guy the guy has is you know is still you know galloping on the road but this is how many of us are we haven't come to a point of decision we're still thinking we're still that's what many of us do meanwhile god is telling you okay this man is the one for you or maybe god has even said this is what you are thinking hey let me hold on to the, what if someone doesn't come? I've given myself a timeline of this, that. So, you know, you can't decide. So you are practically empowering Satan in your life to cause you delays, to cause you to lose time. This is something we all have to keep an eye on. This is something we have to keep an eye on. It's easy for us to say, oh, come here, we're going to address things because, you know, it's from the foundational issue, it's because there's a curse, it's because there's a this and that. But one thing I always say here is, it is my intention that you don't walk away from here without a sense of responsibility as a kingdom citizen. Yes, there are things that Satan does. Yes, there are things that Satan will, you know, do. There's, you know, all kinds of attacks that Satan might cook up. But understand that there are times where you are playing a huge part in what's going on in your life oh i can't decide if i want to move to this. how about you just go and meet god god let me tell you a way that you need to handle this and i hope that you you take this the right way because i'm not trying to tell you that don't listen to god do you know that there are many times i gave you moses example it was when he said you know what? i'm going to turn that's when god spoke to him another time was joseph in the case of mary Joseph was still trying to figure out like what is this kind of thing that's going on and so he decided in his heart to say you know what I, I can't deal with this I'm going to put this girl away because I can't deal with this I'm going to put her away quietly go read Matthew um, 119 that's how it puts it it says um, uh, Joseph had like he, he was minded that's a, he had made up his mind that's what that thing meant he, it said he made up his mind he made a decision like you know what I'm going to put her away quietly I'm, I'm going to, you know, try to find a nice way to do it. It is, the, God came to him in that place and said, don't do it because I'm the one indeed responsible for this pregnancy. Many, please listen to the first thing I said. Many of us fear making a mistake so much that we are, uh, we are unknowingly choosing stagnation. We have unknowingly partnered with Satan to, 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 to promote stagnation in our lives. It wasn't the right decision that John, uh, sorry, Joseph made. I want you to get that. Because when I gave the example of Moses, you're like, but that was the right decision. Joseph was making the wrong decision. He decided he was going to put away Mary quietly because he's like, you know, she, she's a good girl or at least, you know, I, I don't want to be a bad guy or whatever it was that he, he was thinking. He said, I'm just going to put her away quietly. He had made a decision. <laughs> it was not the right decision. But you have to understand that the Bible describes Joseph as a devout man. He was a good man. 
as I told you, when your heart is right with God, God will step in and give you truth. But if you sit down in a place and refuse to make a decision, you are still holding this offer. You claim you are praying and you haven't. God is not even giving you anything. Come on. Come on. Even the person that God tells to wait, God will tell you, wait. Oh, I'm not the one or this or that. Some of us hide under this, this, ex, this excuse. That's what we use. It's kind of an excuse for us. It's a crutch. Because we just don't know how to come to a place where we are able to, 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 to pray to God to understand what his direction is. So many times what you have to do is come to God. God, this thing is before me. I'm not sure what your will is in this, but I'm willing to, like, I'm okay with whatever your decision is. If you're saying this is the person for me, that is fine. If it's not the person for me, you know, that's fine too. You have to be able to approach God in this way and say, I have made up my mind. I'm okay with what you are doing. Even times when people come to God, you hear what my father-in-law, you know, has, um, he's given that example before. How, I think it was the time he got an international invite and it was already decided in his mind, like wonderful. At last, the Lord said he would open a door and there it is. And it was when he came to God and said, the door that you opened for me and God said, I did not open a door. So perhaps it is that you haven't trained yourself to be able to hear God's word. Why? Because you have not decided to truly turn your heart to God. But something is responsible for keeping you in this state of indecision. And that thing is conveniently stealing time from you. So somebody is saying, oh, I'm waiting to, to hear God. A young man is waiting for, for six months. He's waiting for nine months. He's waiting for a year, 18 months. And you now come back and say, okay, because nobody else came, you now come back and say, okay, I think God is telling me, my dear, this man has printed his wedding invite. He's getting married to someone else. Do you understand that this is how people have lost out on things? The mother always gives, you know, talks about this thing when we, we sit and talk. Like, <clears throat> like I said, the cement will help you. So some people really sit down and assume they have all the time to make quality decisions. You are in a season when people are coming before you, people are coming to you, and you won't be wise to sit down with God and choose one person and go. You are still like, eh, this, I can't decide that. And the next thing, you raise up your head and everywhere is like a desert. Nothing and no one is approaching you. At the time, there were all these different people. There were all these different opportunities. And you kept saying, oh, I'm waiting for God to speak. God had spoken since. God was waiting to see which way you were going to go. God was waiting to, 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 to tell you this is where I want you to go. But you refused to participate in any of that. It's like, I'm waiting for God. As though God will have to come down in person and tell you. And next thing, you raise your head and this thing is gone. I preach and I talk about the, re the need to be attentive to time because it is important. It is a unit of your destiny. Yes, it matters in your destiny. Um, there are windows that if you miss them, if there are things God is trying to do in a certain time and you miss it, then you don't get to do it anymore. Some of these things are that tough to receive, but th that's how tough they are in reality. You miss that window, you don't get to do it anymore. So you have to ask God to train you to come to a place of quick decision. The example I gave earlier um, about this whole thing that I was, you know, trapped in and it was like Satan was trying to offer me something. The reason why, you know, like I said, do you know part of the reason why I was able to hear God tell me like, because I sat down, I looked at the thing, I said, you know what, verily, this is the Lord. <laughs> this is God's, this is God's benevolence towards me. And yes, let's go for it. And in that moment, listen, you have to train yourself as a child of God to be so confident that God is willing to move mountains to speak to you and keep you from falling. Believe it because it's the truth. So I said, alas, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in my sight. Got on my computer, started to build the website. And God just said, dear, I'm not in this thing. And once that was it, I moved away. I just left it alone. So could it be that the reason God hasn't spoken to you or you haven't received your answer is because even God can see in your heart that you have not yet made a decision that his answer is good enough for you? Is it possible that the reason that you are not hearing God's voice is because you have not even decided in your heart that if God tells you this is what I want you to do or how I want you to respond to this, that you will actually take it? Think about these things. Think about what this state of indecision looks like. Fear sometimes promotes it. Oh, I'm afraid of making a mistake. I'm not telling you to live your life as a, 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 a diary of mistakes, but I'm telling you that, one, if your heart is right with God, he will protect you from making those mistakes. Two, 
There are people who made serious mistakes in the Bible, but God still made a provision to recover them. Is it possible that you don't have enough faith in God's ability to steer your life, so you think that it all comes down to you? You think that the whole thing rests on you, so you are the one with the responsibility to make this decision, so you cannot make any... Like, you, you get so wrapped up in it. Many times you have to release your heart and say, God, this offer came to me, oh, I like it, and I want to go and take it. What do you think? And God says, take it. It's indeed for me. Or no, it's not for me. This is what your life needs to look like. Get to a point of quick decision. Get to a point of quick decision. There's a verse I saw in uh, Joel chapter 3, um, verse 14. I like the way he put it. It says here, it says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. He said, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Is the place where you decide, I have made my decision. That many times is where you will hear God's voice clearly. The last thing I want to touch on as one of the other ways that Satan steals time from people is sin and disobedience. I don't think there's any need to go deep into this because I think we all understand what that looks like. Sin and disobedience. A, 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 a strong way that Satan steals time from people. And I'm not just talking about sin, you know, the way you might look at it as like, oh, you know, uh, the Ten Commandments in the Bible, well, I don't kill anybody, I don't do this. The Bible says in James 14, sorry, James 4 and 17, it says, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. This is what looks like sin for God. So sin and disobedience is one way that you will quickly lose time. God is telling you, go here. God is telling you, do this. And you decide that you're not going to do it. The Bible says, for him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So you already know that this thing is what God will have me do. This thing is what God is calling me to do, but you refuse to do it. You refuse to do it. Even ties to the, uh, first, the last point I just made, that indecision. Oh, I know God is calling me to do this and that. Do you know that this is the reason why some people's destinies are delayed? I'm sorry I'm going back a little bit. I just feel the need to mention this before I wrap up this aspect of sin and disobedience. There are people who know God. Okay, you already know that God is calling you to do this. God is saying I need to uh, go into ministry. God is telling me to move into this. God is telling me to move into that. But you are so trapped in indecision that you can't even take one step. That's why the Bible says that do not think you will receive anything from God. Oh, maybe I shouldn't. Okay, what if it's not like this? What if it's not like You don't know because you haven't even made a decision. How about you come to oneness with that awareness, with that knowledge? That, okay, God has called me to do this. And so I'm going to step out and I'm going to... Do. Many of us can't make a simple decision to, to take the first step in what God has called us to do. Again, I apologize for going back there, but I need to go back there. So you say, oh, God has called me to uh, own this. God has called me to start. That. You can't even take the first decision. The first decision me I made in my situation, I went and started building websites. Okay, this must be God telling me that this is an opportunity for me. Boom, I went to build a website. God said, my dear, you better back away from that thing. I'm not in that thing. And I'm like, thank you. But many of us can't even make that first decision. Oh, okay, God is calling me to ministry. Okay, so where do I begin? Okay, so perhaps I need to start online or maybe I need to start... And at that point, God says, actually, no, you should start it, you know, physically or, you know, whatever. Or, oh, God is calling me to do a business. We can't make a first decision. You can't even decide. You can't even begin. So have you figured out, okay, how is financing going to come? Am I going to fund this thing for my savings? Am I going to work with partners? Am I going to take a loan? Like, what does this mean? You cannot. Is somebody understanding what I'm saying? You haven't come to a single decision. And you are expecting God to give you a whole textbook. It's not how it works. It's not how it works. Many times you have to come up out of there. Let me tell you what that looks like. Many times making that decision is you, you know, is the word disempowering, a, you know, an, an existent word. You are disempowering fear off of you. You are willing to make a bold step. And you are believing God. That's why it says, let him ask in faith. You are trusting God to hold your hand through. So you make that decision and then God tells you, yes, do it this way. I do want you to start it in person. I do want you to work with partners or I do want you to take a loan. You haven't made a decision. You haven't made a single decision. You are shelving everything and handing it off to God. It is a way of being spiritually lazy. You hand everything over to God. Oh, God will tell me, God will tell me, my dear, that is partly the reason why you are still where you are. 
God will, God will, God will. You have not made one decision. God has done the work of telling you, okay, go and do this or this is what I want to do. You haven't made a single decision. You say, ah, God, God is not, God is waiting for you to make a move. He's waiting for you to express your faith by taking action one way or another. And then he can tell you, okay, be going that way. Keep going. Yes, that way or no, come back this way. Please, don't forget this. Indecision is not, it's not, a, uh, it's not a beautiful trait. It's not like, oh, it's just how I am, my dear. It's not how you are. You are, you are helping Satan. He doesn't have to do work. He, he can actually move on to other people. Why? Because you have done the work for him when you stay in this place of indecision. And lastly, like I was saying, sin and disobedience is very clear. I don't think there's any need to elaborate on that more. You will quickly lose time in your life when you are stuck in disobedience. God is telling you do this. God is telling you go back to this place. God is telling you go meet that person and you refuse to do it. And you know that God is telling you to do it. And you choose not to. Why? For whatever reason. Maybe fear. Maybe, oh, what do people say? Or, oh, what is it going to look like? Oh, what if it... Like, you, you have decided that you are willing to, 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 to take someone else's instructions. And sometimes that person is you over God. Sin and disobedience will quickly empower delay in your life, will quickly empower stagnation in your life. And then you will go through that whole process. You would have been battered. You would have been bruised. You would have been attacked by the enemy. And at that point, realize that you have lost so much time. This is another way that the enemy still stands from people. This is another way because it's a door you then open. Because once you choose to tow the path of disobedience, oh, just understand that you are, you are, you are breakfast for the enemy because he will have every point of access into your life. But before we close, I want us to actually now look at, you know, God's plan of recovery. Because when a person comes to a point of humility, of repentance and says, you know what? I have lost it. I have lost time because I did this. I did that. Maybe in my young days, I did this and I did that. Maybe in my adulthood, I dilly-dallied so much. I shuffled my feet so much that I kept losing opportunity after another. What does it look like when God decides to step in and bring recovery to a man's life? The first thing that he will do for that man is that he will bring speed. He will bring speed into that issue. When you find that you are in a place where you have lost time, you look back and you find that some things that should be done and should have been done in your life 10 years ago, you are just beginning to scratch the surface of them now. You need to come to a place of humility and cry to God for help. Because part of his recovery plan is that he will introduce speed. I know that many times, like I said, we look at this thing and just say, oh, God will restore the canker worms. Yes, you are, or rather the years that the canker worms and the palmer worms and all that. Like this, this is, we just want to run into the prayer and just say, ah, I decree and I declare. I, I think part of what I try to do in this house is to help people take a step back and not just live a I declare and I declare life blindly. Understand the way that God works. Understand what is actually causing your problem. You decree and declare, but you don't even know how you got there in the first place. How do you ensure that Satan doesn't trap you in that same spot another time? So part of the way that God brings this recovery for you is speed. Is speed. God is able to do things in your life where he's able to then compress time for you. So something that should have happened in your life a few years ago, God is able to bring that speed for you such that it's almost like you have double promotion. It's almost like that. And I can tell you personally that I have experienced this dimension of God. I have experienced this dimension of God. When one thing, for one reason or another, it felt like I honestly felt like I was left behind. It honestly felt like I was left behind. Everybody seemed to be taking a step every year. And I was very clueless. I was ignorant. I didn't know what was going on. And it seemed like every other person had moved except me. And I started wondering, I said, what is the meaning of this? And I went to God and I cried to God. I said, God, is this how my own path will keep dragging? Is this how my own will keep moving in at this pace? And when I tell you that God introduced speed. So yes, everybody was moving one year at a time. And after four years, I looked up and it seemed as though they had moved so much further ahead of me. But God stepped into that situation. And instead of allowing me move up, you know, one level, he bumped it up. Was it two or three? I can't even remember. Like he just, he, th this is what it looks like when God steps in and brings speed. And this is what God's recovery plan looks like. So that's why I'm telling you that regardless of what re the reason is that you lost time, whether it was through demonic delay, a lack of discernment, sin, or disobedience, or 
inability to make decision. When God decides to restore that time to you, part of how he does it is that he brings speed. So out of nowhere, I'm like, God help me. And next thing, he really does move this thing. In a way, that, listen, I don't think there are many people who can say that this has happened for them. There are gates, there are rules, there are policies that prevent, you know, things like that from happening. But I'm telling you right now that I'm a testimony that God can bring speed. And he does not need to stay within the confines of a protocol to enact that. He doesn't need to stay within the confines of a protocol to do that. This is what speed looks like. So you've been delayed from having kids for a number of years. And next thing, God shows up and then he gives you, you know, twins. He gives you triplets. This is how God introduces speed into your issue. So you were delayed. You didn't have a job for this amount of time or whatever. And it seemed like everybody had passed you by or whatnot. And now God shows up. And instead of you getting a job entering at this level, for whatever reason, the hiring manager or the HR decides that they need to bring you in at that level. Do you know what that is? That is speed. That is the hand of God bringing speed. So if you would have gotten a job at the same time when everybody was getting a job, you should have been, you know, entered the same level one with all of them and kept moving. Here you are three years after. Your mates are now in level three or level two and you did not get a job. And now God decides to step into your issue and decide and you go and apply for this job. Somehow the spirit leads your steps. You apply for this job. I don't know where you source the boldness from, but you're like, you know what? I'm going to apply for this job. It's a level three job. You go there, you interview, and suddenly the person says, oh, we've been expecting a candidate like you. And next thing, you are given the authority, and next thing you resume. What is that? That is speed. That is speed. So yes, maybe you lost time because maybe you weren't paying attention. Maybe the enemy attacked you. Maybe it was different things. You couldn't decide. Next thing, the opportunity, more. whatever it is, God can introduce that speed. So we're going to be praying this uh, afternoon because we are, we are coming to God and trusting him to restore time to us. We are trusting him to restore time to us. Another way that God restores time for you is that he brings you back into alignment. He brings you back into alignment. This is the first way actually, and I should have probably started from this. The first thing God does when he wants to restore that speed is that he brings you back into alignment. It is after he has brought you into alignment that that speed can now come in. The Bible says in Job 33 from 23 to 25, it says, If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show unto man his uprightness, then he is gracious unto him and saith, Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. It says his flesh shall be fresher than a child's. It says he shall return to the days of his youth. This is restoration of time. Do you understand what I'm saying here? This is restoration of time. It says he will be returned to the days of his youth. So the things that you thought you lost because you missed it at a certain age, at a certain stage in your life, at this stage, God is bringing it to you and compressing it with a speed that is almost as though it never happened. It's almost as though that last, that lapse, that gap never happened. He is restoring you to the days of your youth. This is what restoration of time looks like. And so we're going to pray today because there, if there's one thing that we know about Jesus, take a look at verse 10 of John chapter 10. It is on the basis of this that we're going to pray. Because indeed, yes, God is going to restore all the years that the canker worm, the palmer worm, and all of that have stolen. That's going to happen here today. But I want you to see scripture. I like this particular one today as we close out. It says here in John chapter 10 and verse 10, it says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Let me tell you why I've read that scripture. If you go and look in the concordance to see what that word time is translated to, I know we all say it's Zoe. But there are two things that they use to describe that word life in there. Yeah, sorry, it's life in there. On the one hand, it says life. I mean, it literally just means life. On the other hand, it says lifetime. It says lifetime. So if you read this scripture within that context, you will hear what Jesus is saying. It says the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That is that the enemy may have come into your life through any of these doors that were open to steal time from you. It says, but I am come that they may have time. 
Because remember that I said that time is a unit of life. So if you can replace that word there, life, you can put time in there and it is valid. It says, I have, I have come that they may have time. I am I am come that they may receive time back. I have come to give them back their time. It says I have come that they may have time and have it even abundantly. So I don't know how you feel your life has played out. I don't know how much delay you think you have suffered. I don't know how much stagnation it feels like your life has been marked by. But I want you to understand today that part of what God came to send Jesus to do is to restore your time. It says, I've come that they may have life. Yes, I'm trying to tell you that you can see this in two different ways if you read the concordance. Life, yes, life, Zoe life, you know, eternal life, life with God. But also part of that is lifetime. Like I can restore the time. I can restore anything that the enemy stole from you. I can even restore time that he stole from you. So I don't know what it looks like today for you. I don't know what area of your life it feels like Satan has really stolen time from you. Or oh, everybody else has moved to this level and I am still here. Or oh, everybody has achieved this and I still can't even come close to it. I do not know what that looks like for you today. But I know that the assignment on the altar today is that there is going to be restoration of time. So I want us to come off mute today and pray according to the scriptures that this is what Christ has come to do for me is to restore my time, is to restore my time and to restore it abundantly. That is to give me speed. That is to give me lost time. That is to bring me back into opportunities that I've lost, bring me into seasons of my life that I, have, I may have missed because of time that I lost. I want you to open your mouth this afternoon and begin to pray and say, Father, let time be restored, even according to what Jesus came to do for me even according to what Jesus accomplished for me let my time be restored to me today in the name of Jesus let us go